going to have a Think Back Paradise Lost book nine um, and the section from line 48 to line 191, which is Satan's approach to Earth and his first soliloquy or his first monologue. So in this section, then we shift from Milton's narration, which you'll, you would have hopefully watched in the video before, to Satan who flies to Earth. So in a previous book, he's been banished from paradise by Gabriel um, and he's been hiding on the dark side of the earth in the sky. Um, and this is quite interesting because when he's flying around the earth, he flies three times horizontally around it and four times vertically, always hiding in the horizon. Um, guards have been sent to protect earth from Satan. Um, so Uriel has been on guard having a look at his previous penetration of Eden in book um, four. And we can see that influence of Galileo because um, who Milton met because he's thinking about the cosmology, he's thinking about the structure of earth and the heavens and he uses Satan hiding in this dark part of earth. Um, we can also think about the seven days that he flies around as being a subversion of God's creation of earth. So from the Bible, God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day and Satan later um, in this book boasts that he'll undo what took God seven days in one day so that number of seven is quite important. Um, so he enters paradise first of all as a mist and then has a look at the animals and decides to inhabit a snake for his persuasion. And then he has a monologue or a soliloquy and he despairs that he cannot take joy in Earth's beauty. Um, remember, he's in Eden, it is beautiful. And he vows that he will take revenge on God for forcing him to fall so far by destroying it and all of mankind. So we're going to have a look at this through four key quotations. Um, lots more that you could use. These are just the four that I particularly like in this section. Oh, and he takes possession of a sleeping serpent. Um, so he has a bit of a monologue after studying the creatures before he decides to take on this snake. So our first quotation is, In meditated fraud and malice bent on man's destruction, Morga what might hap of heavier on himself. So this is from lines 55 to line 57, and this is Satan's primary motivation. And he's doing everything that he's doing because of revenge. He's going to use fraud, he's going to use malice, and he is going to destroy man. It doesn't matter, morga means despite, hap, happen. It doesn't matter what consequences he has on himself. And he knows that God will put some strong consequences on him. He is going to do it. Um, really interesting use of meditated here. So um, in the argument to this book, Milton described Satan's meditated guile. Um, and in the previous video, we looked at Milton's unpremeditated verse. So we definitely have that um, motif of meditation and thought and consideration and it being seen as quite a negative thing rather than that um, instinctive nature. And really, Milton believes we should have that instinctive connection with God. So thinking about AO3 then, context, we can think about Satan as a Vindici figure. Um, so Vindici is a character from The Revengers Tragedy, one of Thomas Middleton's plays, a contemporary of Shakespeare. Um, and in this, Vindici is bent on revenge for the sake of revenge. So his, I can't remember if it's his fiance or his wife, um, was killed about 10 years ago and he starts on stage holding her skull and he wants to seek revenge and everything, as we know from revenge tragedies, goes downhill. Um, but Vindici has come to be seen in terms of drama, in terms of the literary context, as this key revenger. Um, Vindici etymologically comes from to avenge, to liberate, to protect. So it's important to think about Satan as an avenger here. This is why he's doing this. He's bitter, he's upset that he's been cast down from heaven and he wants to seek revenge. And this you can link quite nicely to whatever your other text is. 
Um, what are the characters in your other text motivations? Is it revenge? Is it justice? So we do to kill it. Um, we do the Duchess of Malfi, which is a revenge tragedy. So we see lots of Vindici figures in that text as well. We can also think about this quotation in terms of hubris and the hubristic nature of Satan. Um, in the previous video, we talked a little bit about this text being originally planned as a tragedy, as a revenge tragedy almost. Um, and we can still see some tropes of that here. Um, when we think about to what extent is Satan a tragic hero? If you read the whole book, um, which OCR aren't expecting you to do, um, but it's good to have an understanding. In books one, two, Satan is the hero. He is the person that we see. He's giving all these great speeches, but there's a very, very definite character arc. So at this point, he's aware that there will be consequences to his actions, but he still perseveres. He still seeks this revenge, which is a very human flaw, particularly if we think about all this Renaissance drama that um, would have been very prominent when Milton was writing. Later in this book, he he's almost human-like. He stands, the quote is, abstracted from his own evil, stupidly good. So he's not yet fully evil, but I think in book 10, he does have a definite shift to someone who is evil, to someone who is not seen as sympathetic by the audience, or the reader in this case. Um, and this is why I call this a soliloquy rather than a monologue, because it does go on for quite a long time, and Satan's discussing his motivations and his reasons. One of the other texts that we study is Hamlet, and this does remind me of that soliloquizing. Um, so moving on then, if we think about AO5, there's so much criticism on um, Satan as someone who we might feel sympathy as, and we've just had a little think about why that might be. Um, and romantic poets in particular sympathised with Satan. They sympathised with the fact that he hated the, um, hated the man, he hated the power, and he wanted to overthrow the people in power. So romantic poets such as William Blake linked the character of Satan with Cromwell, um, who overthrew with the country Charles I. They link God with Charles I. And Milton is this supportive revolutionary um, because Satan does attempt to overthrow God. Um, interestingly, it's not just a romantic ideal that... Satan is seen as someone to sympathise with. Um, in the 17th century, someone called John Dryden talked about this text and just kind of mentioned as a byline, if Adam had been the hero, not Satan. So he almost takes it as a throwaway that Satan is a hero, which is what romantic poets think as well. But I think we have to be a little bit careful with that interpretation. Um, we know that Milton didn't like people who tried to overstep their mark in the hierarchy, who tried to claim that they were something that they weren't. Um, oh, I forgot I had sneaky little Blake sliding on in. Um, so this is Blake's really, really famous quote about this, a nice one to learn. The reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils and hell, is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. So Blake claims that Milton didn't realise that he supported Satan, but because of his revolutionary background, he did. Um, but yeah, I was going to say that I think that that's quite a simplistic view. Um, Milton hated Charles I because of the tyranny that Charles I had because he felt that Charles I was a despot. And this is what Satan does. He doesn't believe that God is the true authority, so he tries to overstep that power. Charles I, um, I'm sure you'd have done lots on him in your lessons. He was, he, he kind of banned Parliament from doing lots of things because he felt like he had this direct 
link with God and he was God's voice on earth and Milton didn't like that. He didn't like the fact that this one figure claimed that he had all that direct contact um, and he thought that he was overstepping and overreaching in this cosmic order. Um, so Milton wrote a book called, I don't know how to pronounce it, Iconoclastes, um, where he was writing a response to the King's book. So this was a book that was published about a month after Charles I was executed called Icon Basil Basilike. Um, and you can see in the picture that Charles is there, he's kneeling, there's all these religious symbols around him. Um, there are little rays of light from God going into his eye and his head. Um, and Milton did not like this. So he wrote this um, iconoclastes response to this saying, actually, Charles I was not in God's prime view. He wasn't a martyr. He was a tyrant and a despot. So, yes, when we're thinking about where our sympathies lie with Satan, think particularly about um, why we feel sympathy. And should we feel sympathy? Would Milton have wanted us to feel sympathy? Maybe not. So moving on to the second quotation, fittest imp of fraud in whom to enter and his dark suggestions hide from sharpest sight. So in this quotation from lines 89 to 91, Satan has to choose a sneaky looking creature to disguise his thoughts. Um, and in Genesis, Genesis says the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal. Um, this you can link with your other texts to the theme of appearance versus reality to disguise and deception. Um, so in our text, the Duchess of Malfi, when Bosola goes to do his evil deeds, um, eventually he says, never in mine own shape. He doesn't want to see the Duchess who he's going to kill in his own shape and he disguises himself. And we can see here that Satan has to disguise himself, but has to disguise himself in something that seems believable. It's believable that this sneaky serpent would be tricking. I think we, of course, we're not assessed on AO2 in this, on our analysis of language, but there's a really, really nice dichotomy in this quotation of light and dark. So his dark suggestions hide from sharpest sight. And we can see that um, no matter what part of the text you look at with Satan, there tends to be some links to light and dark. Um, in book one, when Satan was cast down from heaven, there was a lake and, uh, sorry, a lake of fire. But this lake of fire gave off darkness, not light. Um, so it's that subversion, that light and dark. Um, and this links to Satan's name. So Lucifer is Latin for light bringer, which reminds us of Satan's connections to heaven. He used to be an angel. He's a fallen angel. Um, Satan, which is what Paradise Lost primarily refers to um, Satan <laughs> as, is Hebrew for the adversary, so the enemy. Um, and Satan was introduced, not in the Bible, um, that is in Paradise Lost as the arch enemy. He's defined by his opposition to heaven. So he's defined by the fact that he, yeah, is against heaven. Um, so these are some quite nice connections to those ideas of light and dark. Next quotation then. The more I see pleasures about me, so more I feel torment within me. Only in destroying I find ease to my relentless thoughts. So in this quotation, um, which I've taken the first part from lines 119 to 121 and the second part from lines 129 to 130, we see that Adam is jealous of earth and he wants to punish God by destroying mankind. This is the only thing that gives him pleasure. Um, and this idea about that torment within him is very interesting and it's ironic because later on a couple of or ten lines down 
he talks about being freed from servitude and glorious but actually satan in this part is recognizing that he's in that self-created hell that torment within him and he cannot find ease to his relentless thoughts unless he's destroying more um, and there's a firm, further irony i know i keep coming back to um, earlier parts of the text but in book one satan has a really famous quotation saying it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven but here we see it's not he has this torment within him this torment inside of him and this links to christopher marlowe's dr faustus um so this was another um one of shakespeare's contemporaries writing um dr faustus is about the guy who sold his soul to the devil um and in this there's lots of talk about hell and how actually being a state of being and it's the state of being away from god if you don't have god's love you are in hell it's not a physical place um it is just inside of you which is even worse um so there's a quote from dr faustus um was written in 1592 all places shall be hell that is not heaven so it is just how when you are away from god and we definitely see that within this quotation that torment within me um and i milton would have made that connection and lots of milton's contemporary readers would have made that connection as well um so it's interesting to think about these intertextual links um in terms of ao4 then so thinking about our connections between texts we definitely have that self-destruction um keep going back to it being a revenge tragedy so the um the the fact that we have that endless cycle of avenger on revenger revenge tragedies don't end happily because how can they when people are just seeking to destroy um we've talked about satan as a tragic hero but tragic heroes should have a sense of anagnosis a sense of self-realization that they've done something wrong um so coming back to the duchess of melfi um Bosola and ferdinand and the cardinal all have those realizations that they've done the wrong thing um there's that nice quotation by ferdinand before he dies whether we fall by ambition blood or lust like diamonds we are cut by our own dust so recognising that it's their own fault that they've led to this end. Um, and the Duchess as well, who arguably is the tragic heroine, recognises, I think, before her death that actually she might have made some of the wrong decisions. Um, but Satan doesn't. He doesn't, I think, recognise the irony. He's just so embittered that he just wants to destroy so final quotation then this is when satan actually realizes that he has to go into this snake oh foul descent that i who erst contended with gods to sit the highest am now constrained into a beast and mixed with bestial slime but what will not ambition and revenge descend to so this oh have the snake sneaking sorry i forgot that animation this is at the end of his soliloquy so he feels that revulsion towards the actions that he's taken um that really nice oh foul descent um this is from lines 163 to 165 and 168 to 169 so satan used to be a god he's here ironically because he was fighting with god to try to be higher than god and try to be higher than jesus and now he's had to descend all the way into a beast he's mixed with that lovely bestial slime but he still tries to justify what he's doing what will not ambition and revenge descend to who wouldn't do this if they were this ambitious and this revengeful um and this links contextually to the great chain of being this idea of the hierarchical structure of matter and life. Um, so if you studied Macbeth before, you'd have had to think about the great chain of being. Um, so this is this idea that um, God is at the top. And then we have a spatial hierarchy in terms of space. So you have God, then the angels, then the noble people, 
um, then the animals, then the lesser animals, then the trees and the plants before kind of hell and demons at the bottom. And this was believed, this was a medieval concept, it was believed in the Middle Ages until the late 18th century, um, so it's quite a dominant ideology that people thought about. And Milton does have this as a firm cosmology in Paradise Lost. We definitely see these rigid hierarchies, not just physically, in terms of physically how far people are from God, but also spiritually, the more Satan kind of doesn't want to um, be one with God, the more he descends. In book four, he turns into a squat toad, that adjective squat linking him down with the floor. In book nine, we don't just see him turn into a serpent, which in the Bible does have legs to start with. So at this point in book nine, the snake, the serpent would have had legs. In book 10, those legs are taken away as punishment for the snake. Um, I always feel a bit sorry for the snake. The fact that he's kind of penetrated by this demon and then he gets punishment by having his legs taken away. Um, but yeah, then he's lower to the ground. But also, not only is he these creatures, Satan also descends to earth in a mist he's a non-physical entity he's not even a person um so that's more to do with this nature near the bottom of the hierarchy so we see that he's descending um he's lowering himself or yeah his ambition and revenge is forcing himself to be lowered down in this hierarchy so another nice quotation and hierarchy and how Satan uses hierarchy to manipulate Eve is um, something that we'll come back to. So in terms of lines 48 to 191, those are the key quotations that I've learned thinking about Satan's soliloquy, thinking about his um, attitude and his motivations. And I hope you found it useful. Only double the 10 minutes I tried to keep it to. Sorry.